Hello and welcome to this ISC and GEO Union's Distinguished Lecture Series as part of the year-long celebrations for the International Year of Basic Science for Sustainable Development. My name is Alison Meston and I'm the Director of Communications for the International Science Council. Some housekeeping, this is a Zoom meeting. Please mute your microphones and feel free to pose questions or write comments in the chat area and we'll make sure they're incorporated during the Q&A. Well, we're halfway through the Sustainable Development Goals and a recent plea from the UN Secretary General last week has asked us to turn words into action to get the world back on track for the 2030 Agenda. Antony Guterres says, this must be the year when we lay the foundations for more effective global cooperation that can deal with today's challenges, as well as new risks and threats down the line. He says that our collection problem solving mechanisms do not match the pace or scale of the challenges we face on climate, conflict, inequality, nuclear weapons and food security. So it's against this backdrop that we launch our first lecture in this series, which discusses the key issues. Um, and today we're looking at firepower, geopolitics and the future, rethinking environmental security. We welcome Professor Simon Dalby, from Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. Uh, before we do though, let's go to Alec Ismail Zadig, Senior Research Fellow from Karl uh, Institute of Technology in Germany. Alec is also a member of the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics, and he's an ISC Fellow. Alec, it's over to you to say a few words. Uh, thank you very much, Jelison. <clears throat> Greetings from Karlsruhe, Germany to all participants. Uh, we scientists try to help our society in solving many urgent problems, and that they are uh, challenging problems. Uh, they are associated with the uh, environmental, climatic change, as we know, uh, and we'll hear today, disaster risk, water, food security, in, uh, energy security for future generation, as well as the many other problems. And the, all pieces of these interdisciplinary problems are rooted in basic sciences. Last summer, nine IC union members dealing with the earth and space sciences and grouped under the title Geo Unions put forward an initiative to organize IC lecture series as a contribution to the International Year of Basic Science for uh, Sustainable Development. After negotiation, the selection of lectures, organizational work, I'm happy that this initiative has been realized as the IC Distinguished Lecture Series Basic Sciences for Sustainable Development in the form of monthly webinars. On behalf of the GEO unions, I thank the International Science Council for accepting this proposal. Special thanks go to Alison Menzon, uh, Meston, uh, who spent some of her valuable time to take care of the proposal. I believe that the lectures will highlight the importance of basic science for sustainability and to look forward to listening to the first lecture in the series. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alec. Well, it's not just me. There's a whole team behind the ISC lecture series, including James and Jane, who are working the controls out the back. So thank you for that introduction and thank you for sharing this idea. Let's go straight into Professor Dalby's lecture. Professor Dalby is a senior fellow at the Centre for International Governance Innovation and also a senior research fellow at the University of Victoria Centre for Global Studies. He's online with us now, but he's recorded his lecture to ensure a great experience uh, for you all. And then he'll join us live for the Q&A at the end. So it's over to Professor Dalby. Thank you one and all for joining my lecture on firepower geopolitics in the future. Uh, the subtitle is really the theme of the talk, Rethinking Environmental Security. Um, but let me start just with a few recent um, historical episodes which put uh, questions of environment and security um, front and centre in our thinking. Last year, in the middle of the fall of 2022, um, Hurricane Ian hit uh, Florida and we all saw the scenes of uh, destruction storm surge destruction here. Um, and if you look carefully at these images, it, what's fascinating is that most of the roofs actually stayed on these buildings and the trailers and, 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 and uh, temporary accommodation that was moved dramatically by the storm surge. 
Clearly, hurricanes are a major problem. They're getting bigger and more severe. Rising sea level is probably making storm surges worse. Um, it's got our attention because in terms of thinking about development, in terms of what can be sustained, um, in thinking in terms of making societies more resilient, um, we need to grapple with coastal um, uh, inundations, obviously. Um, and the fact that so much of humanity is now living in coastal areas means that thinking seriously about coastal geomorphology and how it's changing has to be part of any serious agenda um, grappling with um, how to think about the future. A few days later, um, uh, the storm had moved up the east coast of North America and um, hit the coast of Newfoundland, um, leaving a house that had been well back from the shoreline and supposedly entirely safe from storms precariously um, hanging over the edge of the new shoreline. Um, there's an extraordinary um, uh, scene there because the water heater for the house is still exposed, hanging below, um, leaving the vulnerabilities um, very clear and the dependence of modern societies on all sorts of infrastructural elements um, harshly exposed. This image went um, viral on, on the internet um, and it really serves as a metaphor because in many places, um, societies are rather precarious now in terms of the rapidly changing um, uh, uh, coastlines and the rapidly changing meteorology of, of what we're increasingly calling um, the Anthropocene. It was a year last year um, of extraordinary um, oddities uh, meteorologically. The one that caught my attention uh, was nearly a year ago from when we were doing these lectures um, in March with that extraordinary um, uh, temperature anomaly over Antarctica. So we're getting extreme storms, we're getting um, anomalies like this. And of course, one of the roles of science in terms of sustainable development has to be charting these changes. Um, and this is a particular chart that grabbed my attention because of that extraordinary anomaly, suggesting that we are indeed living in um, new times in which vulnerabilities um, from uh, changing sea levels are one thing, but to my theme of my lecture, of course, vulnerabilities to fire in various forms are another major theme that we all now need to think about. Because, of course, this was uh, one of the wildfires in Australia a little earlier, which happened to occur at the same time as many people were struggling uh, with the new hazards um, of the COVID um, pandemic. And that particularly nasty virus, of course, was making um, uh, large numbers of casualties amongst um, more senior parts of many populations. The multiple hazards that we are now facing are part of what needs to be tackled because this rapidly changing world um, is something in which we are now trying to think about sustainability. We're trying to think about modes of economic development that can actually cope with these increasingly severe hazards. And it is indeed um, one of the themes that connects all this up that I want to talk about um, in the rest of my lecture. Because what it seems to me um, we need to focus on is one of the key physical processes that links all of this stuff together. And that, of course, is the simple matter that all of it is tied into concerns about combustion. We are in danger of moving towards um, a hothouse earth. Um, and uh, it's well worth pointing out um, that this is part of the earth system uh, science discussion. Um, but the hothouse is, of course, as a result of too much combustion. Um, and it seems to me that fire um, is at the heart of uh, the insecurities caused by climate change. And it is, given my so um, given my title of geopolitics, also, of course, very much a um, part of warfare as well. And it's, of course, been highlighted by the um, disastrous um, destruction of both people and property uh, in the Ukraine over the, most of the last year, too. Um, my idea of about um, uh, firepower uh, and the links between warfare destruction, the use of combustion, both in weapons um, as well as in civilian uses, hence the power that fire gives humanity, seems to me to be the heart of, 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 of what many scientists now need to um, do in terms of connecting up the dots between the human and the physical world. Um, and one of the ways I'm trying to do that is precisely um, to extend, extend this notion of firepower, to think about the power that fire gives us um, as a key way of linking up uh, what we have traditionally dealt with in separate um, silos. It's also perhaps worth pointing out 
that Stephen Pine, the uh, fire historian, points out that the fire departments, at least on um, US um, campuses, um, have large um, trucks painted bright colors, hose pipes, ladders, and various other related technology, um, but they are not academic departments. Uh, fire is simply taken for granted across most of what we now study. And his argument is that um, actually we're missing out uh, on uh, a way of thinking about a basic geophysical process, uh, that of combustion, which humanity has partly, but only partly, learned to control. And I think that this is a crucial connection too uh, between uh, the different aspects of climate change, sustainability, development, and science that it might bear um, all of us thinking about uh, more explicitly. Um, anyway, Stephen Pine's um, discussion of the Pyrocene and so on, rather than the Anthropocene, is I think a fascinating way of shifting focus. Um, but it uh, remains to be seen um, as to how useful that can be uh, in coming uh, years in terms of, of a different scientific focus for the, the sustainable development goals. I want to do something slightly different um, right now and take us back to what I think of as the roots of this discussion, linking environment and security. Um, clearly, uh, it has to um, be talked about um, uh, currently, but the historical roots of it are, I think, worth reflecting on. And the most obvious place to start is in Stockholm just over 50 years ago, the first uh, United Nations um, Conference on the Human Environment um, and the slogan of only one Earth and indeed the Barbara Ward and, and, and Randy Dubow book by that title uh, is still worth having a good hard look at in terms of the history of science. It was attended by a number of um, uh, delegates from various parts of the world. There was a whole pile of geopolitics flying there where the um, organizers didn't want to recognize the legitimacy of East um, Germany um, and the Soviet bloc refused to attend officially uh, because of the refusal to allow delegate status to the East Germans. Now, nonetheless, um, various people showed up um, and they generated a declaration. And what caught my attention rereading it um, a few years back uh, was the last point in the declaration um, because it directly connects up with the, the notion of uh, nuclear weapons um, and firepower in my terms. States must strive to reach prompt agreement in relevant international organs on the elimination and complete destruction of such weapons. Um, clearly the environment and the damage that uh, might be done by warfare was part of this discussion, although it frequently got lost in subsequent years. What did get the most attention, probably in terms of geopolitics at least, was Indira Gandhi, the only um, uh, prime minister to show up apart from the Swedish prime minister um, in Stockholm. And her extraordinary speech where she basically said, um, you know, poverty is the, the worst pollution. She went on to point out that um, global, what we now call the global south, um, should not be denied the opportunity um, to develop um, their uh, societies uh, because of northern concerns about environment. Um, and in many ways, the whole north-south debate about environment, I would argue, can be traced to that extraordinary speech from Indira Gandhi back then. And there's all sorts of transcripts around the internet um, uh, of it. What's not very clear is a good image of her making the speech, hence this slide. Um, but I think it's really important to stop and think about this because at the heart of development issues these days are, of course, um, how it is that the global south might be developed um, without um, wrecking the planet, as it were. And this is a theme that comes from Stockholm, um, from Indira Gandhi's uh, extraordinary speech. Although it took 15 years after Stockholm for the uh, World Commission on Environment and Development to actually uh, phrase matters in terms of sustainable development. And we all know this um, definition. It's at the heart of thinking about the sustainable development goals uh, many years later. Um, development needs, needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, it's in some ways an elaborate fudge. In some ways, it's a very, very um, succinct summation of what needs to be done. Um, and the uh, subsequent discussions of sustainable development, of course, led us um, just over 30 years ago now um, to the uh, Earth Summit, uh, where we get both the Convention on Biodiversity and the Framework Convention um, on Climate Change. Um, but nonetheless, despite lots of talk back then um, about how to deal with um, climate, how to get a handle on it was 
deferred to the Framework Convention, um, which talks about preventing dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, um, but doesn't have much clear sense of the urgency of dealing with it. And of course, we all know the history of um, not dealing with uh, climate change very effectively, because the iconic graph of our times um, is, of course, the Manalao plot of carbon dioxide. And once again, it is the task of science to tra track these things, to monitor, to, um, to deal with uh, how it is that um, we can uh, closely um, track the changes that are being induced in the, in the Earth system. Um, and this, in many ways, is, of course, the graph of our failure. Um, if you look at 1992, um, there was a lot less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than there is now. 30 years later, uh, we are struggling um, to grapple with the impacts um, as that house perched on the shoreline um, in Newfoundland um, uh, epitomizes. The Sustainable Development Goals came uh, a whole lot later, of course, um, and it's extraordinary that we're now nearly halfway from 2015 to 2030, which was sort of the target uh, year for the, for, for the goals. Um, and of course, for a whole lot of them, what is interesting to me is, of course, number 13 is climate change. And it is the only one that actually, back in 2015, explicitly stated that it was urgent to be, ta to, uh, to be tackled. There's that asterisk um, on the official documents saying that both it's urgent, but also pointing out that the uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change and the shortly to follow um, uh, discussion in Paris about um, the, uh, the, the um, climate change uh, agreement in Paris um, was uh, what to follow the same year. But again, um, it's uh, noteworthy that we're now halfway to 2030 um, from the 2015 um, year, which in many ways, of course, is crucial because we both the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement come out of, of 2015. Um, but the progress that has been made on dealing with the crucial issue, the urgent issue of climate change has been far too slow But it has also um, fed into um, a much larger scientific discussion, um, uh, particularly about um, the whole discussion about the Anthropocene, because clearly human fingerprints are all over how it is that the Earth system now operates. Uh, and the crucial shift uh, that is encompassed in this word Anthropocene, of course, suggests that the circumstances that humanity has lived through for most of the period we used to call the Holocene, we still do call the Holocene, um, but uh, most of that period, um, the environment was basically a backdrop uh, for the human uh, drama. Uh, but now the sheer scale of human activities is so great that the assumption that the natural world is a backdrop to human activities is no longer tenable. The sheer scale of the transformations that are afoot um, requires us uh, to reconceptualize um, science um, and in terms of dealing with um, humanity as a global forcing agent, um, something which until recently um, hasn't been seen uh, by how sciences have been organized um, as a necessity because the natural world could be taken for um, granted as just there, the stage as it were for the human drama um, to use the Shakespearean formulation. But now we are clearly in a world where um, science has to um, reckon with the fact that human actions um, are key driving forces in, in, in so many ways. Um, we have to reimagine um, smelting as, as, as uh, metamorphic rock making, do we? Um, what about the enormous quantities of concrete? Never mind plastic, um, all sorts of entities showing up in the sediments of the planet and causing the geologists all sorts of headaches in terms of how they might um, designate the golden spike at the beginning of the Anthropocene and confusing processes and start points um, in this debate in ways that are absolutely fascinating, it seems to me, for anybody trying to teach undergraduate sciences these days. Um, because the whole uh, discussion of the Anthropocene and what kind of planet we are making um, is uh, an, in, an entry point now um, for students in, in all sorts of disciplines. And indeed, as far as I'm concerned, should suggest to us that we need to rethink the organization of how the disciplines divide up knowledge um, in perhaps all sorts of innovative ways uh, that we are only beginning to seriously think about in terms of how we reorganize the, um, the, the academy to deal with these new circumstances.
because there are new circumstances and they are potentially dangerous new circumstances um, which do need our attention. Um, we are in danger, according to at least some of the Earth system literature, of crossing tipping points which will reshape how the world works and will reshape um, how it is uh, that uh, policy, politics, um, and responses technologically, as in this um, uh, water bomber, uh, deal with um, the dangers of fires that are spreading, the um, uh, dangers of, of rising sea levels, and all the other disasters that we are increasingly dealing with because of the human vulnerabilities uh, to um, increasingly severe weather. The failures to adapt, the failures to grapple with this seem to me to be what we really need to um, uh, think about. But I can't help the visual pun here. I'm talking about geopolitics with a water bomber um, from this e E3G report last uh, last fall. The um, plane is actually drastically misidentified inside the cover of this report, but the rest of the report seems fairly sound. Um, the point being um, that we have to think also about technology and we have to think in some cases about warfare and, and the kinds of technologies that have been um, uh, gifted to us uh, by weapons research and thing being repurposed. And here, of course, is the notion of a water bomber tackling um, some of the uh, immediate dangers. But the larger um, uh, dangers require us um, to think about geopolitics on a much bigger scale. And this report actually specifies um, three the, uh, sort of categories of uh, um, that we really need to stop and think about. Extreme weather events I've already talked about. Um, and clearly their frequency has increased significantly, but it is also worth pointing out that the rapid urbanization and the migration of humans across uh, most of the world, in many cases towards coastal areas, is also increasing vulnerabilities um, due to the failure to build uh, in ways that allow um, a resilience in the face of these increasing uh, hazards. And that is another one of the sort of obvious links between the sciences um, and uh, human uh, end of, of social sciences in terms of what we need to think about uh, in terms of structures, uh, building and planning. Um, as I speak, um, the uh, extraordinary scale of the disaster in Turkey um, and Syria in February 2023 from the earthquake, not a climate induced disaster, but the many of the people that have died have died because of the structural inadequacy of the buildings um, and indeed um, the necessity of building in a way that doesn't make people more vulnerable has been emphasized once again um, by the huge casualty numbers from the, uh, the Turkey and Syria um, earthquake. Rather more tricky and in some cases more directly related to development issues, of course, are the slow onset events rather than the extreme weather events. Um, and of course, sea level rise is an example of this category. Once again, um, it is very important for um, people building in coastal areas to get some kind of clear sense about what sea level rise is coming um, and hence what the vulnerabilities for infrastructure and build, uh, buildings might actually be. Um, if we get rapid melting in Greenland, if we get um, rapid um, ice sheets uh, collapse uh, in, in on both of the poles, uh, we may well be in for much speedier sea level rise than most people are still assuming. And this has profound impacts for buildings, um, for uh, cooling systems, for coastal power stations, uh, never mind what it does to sewage um, systems too that are built um, are assuming basically stable um, sea level um, outfalls and so on. What is of course particularly concerning and I think is very important um, in terms of scientists trying to get a handle on it is this contentious issue about tipping points. Where are the thresholds um, uh, and, and, and so on? Obviously the, the, the Gulf Stream, the Atlantic Meridional overturning circulation, I prefer to just call it the Gulf Stream, um, not quite the same thing. I realize it's a little more complicated than that, but the point being um, that uh, we really do need to stop and think about um, where it is and how it is that we um, grapple with these um, projections because they matter. My gut sense is that um, any coastal infrastructure that is now being designed needs to be designed in a way that allows it to be adjusted depending on how fast sea levels rise. It shouldn't surely be that difficult to build um, sea walls or to build uh, port facilities in a way that should sea level happen rapidly and um, one can simply sort of stack another deck or two on top of the structures but they need to be designed so that we can do that kind of thing and they're in again 
then of course um, uh, science is absolutely crucial in terms of the projections that are needed so that we can build in ways that are, are, are um, suitably sustainable uh, whatever happens. And of course, yes, fire is related fairly directly to the Amazon rainforest dieback issues um, and uh, whether the new Bolsonaro, post Bolsonaro government uh, with Lula in, in Brazil is going to be able to get a serious handle on illegal forests um, is, is uh, or forest burning is, is one of the crucial questions uh, for the sustainable development goal discussion um, in the next couple of years, whether the um, uh, native folks, indigenous peoples in the Amazon should be given um, full title, full legal title to their uh, their uh, lands under Brazilian law, whether that would help is of course another crucial discussion that goes to the heart of sustainable development and the uh, ecological functions, as well as the economic possibilities for those peoples um, in the Amazon uh, rainforest. All of these issues tie in fairly directly um, to the necessity of thinking about how it is that we shape the future of the world and do so by dramatically controlling the use of fire in its multitudinous forms, um, both in furnaces um, and, and, and in terms of, of wildfires um, deliberately set um, that then get out of control or controlled burns for clearing agricultural land and, and, and. All of these things require us grappling with fire in one form or another, and what kind of power we are going to use um, through fire um, to shape the future of, of the planet seems to me to be absolutely crucial. We all heard the phrase about bending the curve when it came to COVID, um, but of course we need to bend the curve when it comes to the emissions gap too. Um, the current trajectories um, and where it is we need to go um, are absolutely uh, you know, the, the heart of the whole Paris discussion. Um, nobody seems to think we can get to the uh, 1.5 pathway these days, um, but clearly uh, bending that curve is a crucial part of what sustainable development is all about, constraining fire in its various forms, particularly in things like internal combustion engines um, is absolutely crucial. Um, and development, if it is to mean the prosperity um, and sustainability for future generations, requires getting a handle on this very quickly and bending the curve um, so that we no longer um, are in danger of that runaway hothouse uh, scenario that uh, I had a slide of a few minutes ago. In terms of geopolitics, um, quite literally, the existence of some crucial members of the uh, United Nations uh, seems to be in, in doubt. Um, this is the classic cartoon about whether Tuvalu will um, disappear under um, the waves. Um, and this for United Nations members is, well, are we going to actually obliterate uh, um, signed up members for the United Nations organization? Um, because their territorial integrity is, is, is supposedly at the heart of what sovereignty um, and um, national security is all about. But if they don't have a territory, um, are they still a state? Uh, and this is a fundamental question for the international lawyers, um, but it is also something that goes directly to the heart of well, how high will sea levels actually rise? Um, how far above the, the, the pre-industrial um, levels are we actually going to go? Uh, for many states, um, this question of how the seas are going to change um, is, is, uh, is, is fundamental. Um, all of Bangladesh won't get inundated anytime soon, but the southern um, coastal regions may. Um, again, the questions of forest ecology there, um, can we rebuild mangroves? Uh, can we um, figure out ways that will allow um, sustainable livelihoods while we building mangroves along some of these very vulnerable delta coastal uh, regions? Um, it goes to the heart of, of the relationship between science and sustainability. Um, this is a one um, just rough estimate of 20 million climate refugees, um, but there's a whole point about Bangladesh, um, the, the southern end of it um, really is vulnerable to um, rapidly rising sea levels. Uh, and where do those people in Bangladesh go? Um, because if India continues to build fences around the border and tries to constrain Bangladeshi um, uh, exodus, um, uh, and we haven't even mentioned the Rohingyas, um, you know, from from uh, from Myanmar next door. Um, there are already refugees in Bangladesh. Um, these kinds of migration questions um, are, of course, all related to um, how hot it gets, 
uh, how much carbon dioxide fire uh, emits into the uh, atmosphere um, in, in, in coming decades. Because people are on the move. Um, and in this case, perhaps not in the safest, safest modes of navigation. Um, but I think that one really needs to stop and think about this um, because, of course, in part, sustainable development is about um, uh, allowing people to stay home, not forcing them to move. Uh, and the question, of course, of how they move uh, is uh, tied into discussions of security um, and all of the discussions of what to do about refugees in the Mediterranean continues to cause um, very considerable um, difficulty, both for the migrants and for those trying to help them in the south end of Europe. Um, but it also raises questions um, of what kind of fences and walls are being constructed because your politics is about sovereignty, it is about territory, it is about controlling borders in many cases. Um, and again, in terms of February 2023, um, this has uh, been highlighted by discussions of balloons and other objects flying across um, North American airspace, questions of sovereignty, um, questions of, 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 of um, security and violations of these territorial boundaries um, are back in the headlines to a very substantial extent. But this is, of course, um, uh, the southern uh, border of uh, the United States. Uh, this extraordinary structure is supposedly able to rise and fall with the shifting sands um, of the desert. And of course, the irony here is that the, uh, the landscape can move, um, but two and, and, and four-legged creatures um, can't respond by moving two. Um, so we have got a uh, contradiction between territorial sovereignty and ecological change epitomized by this extraordinary structure on the border built before um, Donald Trump got a whole lot of rhetorical excesses in play about um, border walls. But the contradiction between um, uh, fencing uh, migratory patterns for both two and four legged creatures uh, not birds, of course, and not um, what few seeds may be blowing around that part of the world for plants. Um, but the contradiction, I think, here is that is 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 um, it caught in this image of a border fence that supposedly can adapt to changing um, geomorphological conditions, uh, but prevent um, biological adaptations related to the geomorphological changes. And it's this disconnect, these kinds of disconnects. Um, that are part and parcel of how geopolitics links with science, links with sustainability um, in, the, in, in the coming decades. One of the issues, of course, is um, the division of humanity um, and the invocation um, of fear of foreigners, um, the xenophobic rhetoric of keeping the bad guys out, keeping the foreigners out, keeping the, well, whatever designation of those that are other out um, is at the heart of the fear mongering that goes with some of the populist and xenophobic rhetoric of our times. And of course, this relates very directly to um, categories such as race, which are so pernicious um, in, in, in the human sciences um, too. Because of course, one needs to invoke authority when one is doing a lecture like this, and who better um, to invoke the Yoda who knows everything. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. And how it is that we map peoples, how it is that we think about human differences, how it is that we think about, as Indira Gandhi did back in 1972, the relationship between North and South, and whether we can think about um, sustainable development uh, in terms of for the whole of humanity, or whether it is simply uh, a matter of writing off um, large chunks of humanity in the interests of maintaining certain kinds of lifestyles in certain parts of the planet is really what the geopolitics agenda about um, sustainability now has to uh, has to ad address. And of course, hate and suffering are exactly what it is that the sustainable development's uh, goals claim to be countering. And I think it's really important um, that we think um, seriously about, about this, because of course there is a geography uh, to displacement that is at the heart of migration. And we need to think about not only what is forcing people to migrate, but how it is we handle migration and crucially um, the human rights dimensions of the right to move um, and the uh, accommodations that are provided for those who are forced to move. Could you please prepare a place for my country? Um, because obviously um, some places as the world uh, heats may become indescribably hot 
um, to use the words from the original um, uh, Only One Earth document from 1972. And we need to grapple with, with human migration um, and the pathways that are, are possible uh, for uh, people in a world that is increasingly artificial, increasingly disrupted, and in many cases, increasingly ecologically hazardous as the backdrop to um, uh, this young person's um, sign um, suggests all too clearly. Are we seeing uh, the beginnings of the formation of some plastoglomerates in the backdrop to this image? I'll leave that um, to the sedimentologists. The crucial points um, here, of course, are what kind of future is coming. And here too, um, oops, I seem to have this all slightly out of focus. Um, that actually works rather well because it's not clear um, how we might actually do um, gen geoengineering. Um, but clearly the kinds of um, ecological, uh, kind of ecological change that we are actually um, putting in place here um, are captured in this um, diagram. Uh, can we actually um, increase the reflectivity of crops? Um, can we uh, do ocean fertilizing? Should we? Um, these are the big questions of geoengineering, which are increasingly um, emerging, because, of course, this is an attempt to provide a technological solution um, in many cases, rather than a social solution or um, an energy technology solution to climate change. And in terms of geopolitics, once again, the failure to grapple uh, with the effects of firepower is leading to this discussion. Um, if we had grappled effectively with firepower, constraining the destruction that is um, coming as the indirect effect of combustion, um, and in some places the direct um, effect of combustion, um, we wouldn't be facing the kind of geoengineering proposals um, that are increasingly being discussed. And of course, anybody interested in sustainability, the future and the big picture of the Earth system has to grapple with um, some of these issues because increasingly they are popping up uh, in various parts of the world. And as I am um, doing this lecture in, in, in February of uh, 2023, I can't resist putting a slide in about a balloon because, of course, in terms of geopolitics um, and what it is that some of the balloons that are being or have been shot down in, in early February 2023 over North America, um, what's the relationship between science, weather monitoring, and these strange um, entities uh, that are unidentified as of when I speak? Um, the, clearly, the uh, claims by the Chinese that their surveillance balloon was nearly doing weather research um, also raises all sorts of questions about how it is that scientists use technology, the relationships between um, official actions, corporate um, of science uh, and the questions, of course, of territorial jurisdiction, um, because where is it that one might actually do geoengineering experiments if numerous uh, countries don't want them? Do we actually tether balloons to ships and do them in international waters? Um, all of these are increasingly questions that are about ethics or about administration, and scientists need to grapple with them because um, if we don't get a handle on um, the uh, rapidly changing um, climate change problem uh, with uh, you know, reducing the use of fire and combustion and hence dramatically bending the curve on carbon dioxide emissions, we are going to be facing a world in which these questions are um, being discussed. We're also facing a world in which science and what can be or cannot be done safely in terms of geoengineering becomes a major question. Um, and for the current generation of graduate students, um, keep your eye on this, please, because it remains um, an issue that uh, is not going to go away. And of course, Earth system sciences are crucial in terms of uh, trying to link all of these things together. Never forgetting, of course, um, that one of the initial impetuses for doing this kind of thinking was the concern about nuclear winter and the use of firepower combustion in, in a period of future nuclear war was, of course, part of what got some of this stuff uh, moving ahead a few years before Pinatubo in 1991 um, gave us the ability to actually track aerosols in the stratosphere, uh, generating all sorts of interesting ideas about the possibilities of, of, of geoengineering. We are um, facing a new world. Uh, we need to think long and hard as scientists, as policymakers, as policy advisors, and yes, as citizens um, about how we influence the discussion about how the energy um, transformation currently undertaken in this world uh, moves ahead. It is worth pointing out 
that the Russian um, attack on Ukraine uh, in 2022 has uh, generated all sorts of perverse consequences. The spike in, in um, uh, fuel prices, uh, note please, fuel prices, not energy prices, the distinction is crucial. Um, the spike in fuel prices um, has generated huge profits for many oil companies, but it has also spurred um, discussions and in, um, in many countries, uh, rapid increase in investments in renewable energy. Heat pumps are the hot commodity of 2023. Uh, precisely because they are a new technology that allows heating and cooling, um, making uh, life in, in both hot and cold parts of the world um, uh, a little more pleasant, using much less energy than directly um, in, in terms of heating. And that kind of technological innovation has also been driven um, by the geopolitics, uh, which in turn caused indirectly the um, fluctuation of fuel prices in many parts of the world. I insist on the distinction between fuel and energy because fuel needs combustion, gives us carbon dioxide and a whole lot of leaking methane on the pipelines and infrastructure and gas as well. Um, and getting away from fuel and towards energy that doesn't involve fuel is at the heart of the whole discussion um, of climate change, even if we don't often actually um, recognize that it is important to make that distinction. And of course, where I'm speaking from in Canada, um, the fuel companies insist on calling themselves the energy sector, not the fuel sector. And it's a distinction that I think matters greatly um, in terms of how it is we uh, think through what it is that now needs to be done. The Arena folks in this report, which I still think is worth reading, although it's a few years old now, um, suggest um, that there are half a dozen forces for change uh, which are, are increasingly driving this transition. And again, the role of science in terms of how it is we can move the technological innovation ahead, how it is we can track pollution and climate change seems to me to be crucial. Um, universities have been talking about divestment um, and related uh, questions of investor action now for a decade. And I think that that too um, is important in terms of how scientists um, consider their professional responsibilities and their participation in um, either companies or in, in, in universities. Uh, particularly in the case of, of corporate science, which has been um, silenced in many cases um, in the discussions, um, particularly in, in, in companies like Exxon or whatever, who know what's going on with climate change, but don't want to speak about it publicly. Public opinion, of course, is also part of the scientist's responsibility to engage. Um, and of course, one student who had done her homework um, has been extraordinary uh, phenomena in terms of um, changing the public discussion of, of climate change. I guess she does claim that if you've done your homework, you realize we, we need to leave, live, um, live uh, very differently. And she did her homework before she went on the climate strike, of course. Um, and I think that the point of, of this that I'm joking about slightly is the crucial importance of, of knowledge and getting it to, um, uh, to students of all ages. She was in Stockholm um, and celebrating, commemorating, mourning the 50 years of um, lack of action between the Stockholm Conference um, and the 50th anniversary last year generated this uh, report linking quite directly questions of peace and environment. Because, of course, the premise um, for the sustainable development goals has to be um, that uh, we have a peaceful world to allow development to happen. Um, although the perverse consequences of the Russian attack on Ukraine and how that is stimulating um, the development of, of, of renewable energies and things like um, the heat pumps is also uh, worth noting because the connections here are rarely simple. But the Environment of Peace um, project, again, you can Google all of it on, on, on the internet from Stockholm recently, um, has suggested that we need to link the crisis with joint solutions. Um, I've been hinting at a number of those in, in, in my talk so far. Um, preparedness, um, finance, peace, not risk, um, crucial in terms of thinking about um, uh, the abilities of, of, of societies to thrive uh, without the threat of, of armed conflict um, disrupting, uh, disrupting development. Um, thinking about marginalized groups, um, but for scientists, of course, research, education, and inform, making the connections between the different um, issues seems to me to be part and parcel of our um, obligation as scientists um, in terms of trying to um, uh, get the understandings that are needed to make the policy shifts 
um, into the larger population it seems to me to be a crucial part of our, our topic. But we do face um, the difficulties, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, of some of the big corporations pushing back on this. And indeed, in early 2023, some of the larger oil companies have explicitly said that they're pulling back from green investments, concentrating on, on profitability of the uh, their fossil fuel um, sector. And the denial um, of uh, the science in terms of business plans suggests a huge disconnect between where science says we have to go and where the profitability of corporations under the current business model suggests should be their priority. And I think that all scientists have to grapple with, with this particular issue because maybe it is time to go solar. Um, and the violence of um, uh, trying to remove protesters who are trying to stop pipelines um, suggests that we have got a major issue here in terms of which side the security services are on, because clearly a sustainable future requires um, uh, that the policing should be um, preventing uh, large corporations from building ever more fossil fuel infrastructure, which we simply can't um, sustain if we're going to have something like a stable climate um, in the future. Uh, and this is really the political contradiction here and the multiple roles of firepower um, are, are what I'm trying to try to highlight here. Because if we are serious, um, clearly investing in a future that is much more focused on renewable energy has to be where um, the policy world goes. And while I might use a much more authoritative um, graph from the International Energy Authority, which has begun to um, seriously think about the transition, in the last few years, they have changed course from simply promoting fossil fuels to actually taking renewables much more seriously. Um, but this graph works best in a, in, a, in a PowerPoint, so here we go. The crucial point, of course, is that the yellow um, uh, part of this is the rapidly increasing investments in solar energy and, relatively speaking, other forms of energy, um, the fossil fuels. Oops, I caught myself doing that again. The other forms of fuel investments fossil fuels are fuels, then combustion, hence the climate change problem, um, are clearly declining um, over the, the, the last decade. And I think that it is crucial that we emphasize this uh, transition is part and parcel of what we absolutely have to do, uh, because if we are going to live comfortably within um, the donut in, in Get Roth's um, terms, uh, we need to recognize that we need to link the human and the ecological um, into a uh, sustainable uh, future for all of us. And it seems to me that we may need to think about how to do this in ways beyond what Paris Agreement and the Framework Convention has so far done. And just to conclude, um, let me then say that one of the more interesting um, and innovative suggestions in the last few years takes me back to the question of, of, of geopolitics and the dangers of warfare, because of course arms control was the response in the 1970s um, to that demand in Stockholm that nuclear weapons be, um, can, the use of nuclear weapons um, be, be constrained. And in the process, um, of course, we ended up with all sorts of non-proliferation treaties um, for nuclear weapons and so on. And the analogy um, with fossil fuels, of course, um, has been uh, promoted in the last couple of years. Vanuatu um, happened to be the first state last year that called for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and other states are considering this or making statements in support of it over the last little while because to use the slogan from the climate um, protesters uh, we need to keep it in the ground this is a geological demand um, in politics um, which goes to the heart of the earth systems discussion because if we don't get the fossil fuel out of the ground and burn it, then we are dramatically reducing um, the scope and the scale of uh, climate change um, uh, destruction by both rising um, seas um, and also the increasing um, uh, proliferation, is that the word, of wildfire. And constraining this um, suggests a neat um, policy parallel between arms control and fossil fuel control, uh, which should be at the heart of uh, the next um, few years as we try to follow through um, with the, uh, the sustainable development um, goal number 13 in particular, because it has implications for all of the others. And hence, this needs to be um, a more innovative discussion about what kind of policy measures uh, might be uh, useful. And here are the parallels between military concerns about firepower um, and climate concerns about the use of too much fire to power many things.
um, provides us with a link across uh, policy domains, which might be an innovative way uh, for many scientists to grapple with um, how it is that we all shape the future collectively. Thank you. Um, what, a, what a rich and fantastic um, discussion, Professor Dalby. Um, you know, we, uh, we talked about uh, the, the, the link between uh, the earth systems and, 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 and geopolitics, and, and I just find it fascinating um, in terms of a geological, the, the geological unions. Could I think about this discussion 20 years ago? Uh, we are now facing a time when uh, issues around social science and, and natural science are coming together in order to, to really um, find pathways forward. And I hope that uh, I hope that we can give hope <laughs> because sometimes it's depressing to hear these types of lectures. And, and so I would I would ask that uh, that, that perhaps one of the questions that we could consider is, is how do we as a science community give hope that we can find a way forward for some of these, these critical issues? And then we'll go into some of the discussions that we've had. Professor Dalby, if you can come on and turn your video on. Oh, have we lost, have we lost Professor Dalby? Yeah, hi, Alison. I'm, I'm sorry, I think Simon may be having some technical difficulties. He seems to have dropped out of the meeting. Okay, could you please contact him? Absolutely. And, and bring him back in. And Alec, I'm going to ask you to come in in Simon's absence and turn on your, uh, turn on your, your uh... yeah, so if, yes, hi. Um, we, we, we'll, we'll try and get uh, Simon back as soon as possible. Um, um, what, what, a, what a rich discussion. So, so I, one of the things I, I, that really struck me, and we'll, we'll move into some of the, the, the discussion points that the, the, the folk have asked. One of the things that really struck me was this the slide that he put up about the fossil fuel companies um, and the disconnect between what science is requesting and what the evidence is requesting versus what the, the money-making, profit-making structure um, is, uh, is, is suggesting. And I, and I think, you know, you have this idea about keeping it in the ground, but then you have the fossil fuel companies who are going to have stranded assets and you have this convergence of geological and profit-making and sociological. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, Simon's back. So Simon's I'll, back. <laughs> <laughs> he missed this question, so I'll let you answer that and then we'll bring Simon back in. Yeah, yeah. The, the point, I think it's a quite uh, important in terms of this present day, actually, this, how we... Uh, face the present day situation in the world. Because it's uh, from one side, exactly as uh, uh, Simon mentioned, it is an uh, uh, initiative of scientists supported by uh, governments, at least at the, in the form of their uh, agreements or treaties and so on. At the same time, we have uh, other things, which is uh, called the money, and everybody is looking for the, how to get a benefit and the, uh, it is uh, not only the uh, industrial people, but as well as the governments. That's why here it is uh, some type of the contradiction which we face for many years, but today it becomes uh, quite clear, I think, for everybody that we need uh, somehow to find a solution to resolve this issue. And I think Simon highlighted this, uh, uh, and uh, Simon, uh, this uh, discussion about the uh, how how it is possible to get this uh, important, scientifically proven, and this evidence-informed uh, 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 decisions-based uh, solutions, which not working, because it's uh, the last, last, for example, this uh, UN uh, climate uh, change. Uh, the COP uh, mm -hmm. also showed that it's, uh, you know, there is a, some agreement, some agreement, but it's uh, when they say everybody goes at home, they are doing their urgent problems, which not sometimes those which are required for society. 
Simon, we, we lost you, but you're back. Um, yeah, my, so... my, my laptop seemed to hang up for some reason. Um, I'm back on an <laughs> iPad okay. and, and uh, I'm actually quite relieved to be back because I wasn't sure I was going to get in at all. Um, okay. the, uh, the, there's a windstorm in my neighborhood and there's a tree down this uh, on lines just down the street. So um, it's it's uh, just very, very appropriate context in which to discuss <laughs> things. Well, you might not have ever heard me saying what a rich and, and wonderful uh, lecture that you've given us. And just thank you so much. And I, and I just think in, in this critical time in, you know, this is the International Year for Basic Sciences and Sustainable Development. And I mean, you've touched on some critical issues. And I, I wanted to, to raise the issue that, that Henry raised about um, geopolitics um, and and climate change blurring state boundaries in order to ensure more harmonised approach to address common issues. And while you were sharing that slide about Tuvalu, I was thinking, you know, in a worst case scenario, you know, if, if we did lose Tuvalu, would somebody who identifies as being Tuvaluan exist in the digital space? Um, you know, these are the types of geopolitics issues that that we could we could critically face. Could someone who identifies as living in Bangladesh, where a border's gone up, could they then exist in a in a digital space? And Henry goes further and talks about how um, how do we have uh, AI integrations for day to day operations? So let's have a bit of a discussion about you know the geopolitics of 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 the, the what's happening in the the Earth's systems and versus the, the digital revolution in which we're currently living in? I think that the, the digital revolution is, is changing an awful lot of things. Um, uh, I did mention heat bumps. Sometimes the Americans call them mini splits for some reason or other. Um, uh, these days, as, as sort of a technological innovation uh, that is, 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 is changing how we think about um, energy, how we think about practical things like heating and cooling buildings, in terms of the AI on, on this, um, this may well provide us with you know, much better, much more efficient technologies in some form. Your point about digital citizenship, of course, is, is really interesting because if it is that the Tuvaluans um, are, you know, end up without actually having a state, can they have a digital um, identity of some sort on some server in Oregon or, or um, whoever, wherever the cloud is currently residing? Um, but whether that can then be translated into some kind of citizenship rights um, uh, if they don't actually have a tech, uh, have a territory, um, I think is a really big question that we're all going to have to grapple with because clearly some states are in, likely to be inundated. Now, in the case of many of the, the atoll, um, uh, low-lying atoll states, the populations are small. Um, when I started this, um, thinking about these things more than 30 years ago, um, I remember uh, discussing this with uh, some folks at the International Affairs Institute in Auckland in New Zealand. Um, and and they, their one comment from a questioner there was, well, I mean, you know, if, if, if Tuvalu or Kiribati or, or a number of the other states simply disappeared, who would notice? Well, clearly the folks, Kiribati and Tuvalu would, but the point was made that half the population of, of, of some of those actual states already um, mm. lived in, in suburbs of Auckland anyway. Um, and that you know did give me pause because um, small populations can can perhaps uh, um, move. Can they maintain a digital identity? Well, presumably with AI and with all the, the new technologies, this is possible. But the legal rights issue about uh, about that is is something that I really think we need to to, to address. Um, and how it is that one might maintain some kind of citizenship rights in a state that no longer um, has territory is, is one of the big questions that we're going to have to grapple with. Um, the lawyers will have a field day on that one and hope that they get to, to, to work on it fairly quickly. Again, whether one can get international agreement <laughs> on, on digital citizenship um, is going to be a fraught issue indeed, um, mm. but it's clearly something that needs to be thought about. Uh, and uh, you know when then you know do we then have a situation where uh, <laughs> we have um, bad behavior in cyberspace and, and, and digital rights being challenged by hackers? Um, it gets us into a whole new um, realm, mm. which mm. clearly um, 
is, is, is one of the things that's going to have to be addressed. Well, let's let's um let's move from the digital space to to outer space and perhaps talk about one of the other issues that's been raised in the chat about geoengineering. And uh, Ismail Sarageldan, who is a, a, a previous patron of the ISC and now a, a now a, a fellow of the ISC talks about geoengineering in terms of, you know, once the toothpaste has come out of the tube, you can't put it back. Um, and, you know, here we are, you know, at the end of the year, we'll be having COP28 in, in the United Arab Emirates, a country that, uh, you know, does practice things around geoengineering around, around the, you know, in order to make rain. Um, let's talk about that. Where do we stand um, with geoengineering discussions potentially around the, the UNFCCC? Um, is there enough discussion from the geo unions? Do you have a voice um, in um, areas like this at the UNFCCC? Is there a voice for the geo unions to properly have this discussion around geoengineering? Um, is it right? You mentioned that we're probably, you know, we're, it's unlikely that we're going to remain under 1.5. Do we have to own up to this and actually start talking about this kind of? Oh, sorry, uh, um, Burgess has just said make, making rain is not the same as energy engineering. I apologise for that. Um, and 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 Professor Dal Dalby can correct me. Um, where where does that where does that leave us in terms of of a, a proper discussion around geoengineering and the space to have an honest discussion with 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 it? Um, full disclosure, I signed on to the um, no um, uh, experiment um, a, a, a declaration there um, a few months back, trying to get people to stop and think very carefully about how we address these things before we start doing all sorts of experiments in the atmosphere. Because yes, the toothpaste tube issue is, 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 is the problem. Once we start doing this seriously, um, uh, then it's very, very hard to put the, the, the toothpaste back in, in the tube. Um, the point being, um, that governance of these issues needs to be discussed first because the potential for this getting out of control um, is, is very considerable. Yes, rainmaking may not be geoengineering, but uh, it's, you know, it's, it's not that far off insofar as it's artificially modifying some aspects of, 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 of the weather system. Um, yes, one can argue that China's been doing this for a long time. There have been all sorts of experiments going right back into the 50s on cloud seeding, cloud seeding in, the, in, in the United States. Um, if you wish to actually enhance cloud formation, it's the other side of it, and that's a form of, of, of geoengineering. Um, I think this is very, very um, tricky. The you know the the um, president that worried me um, was Ahmadinejad, the um, uh, Iranian um, president, a while back, actually tried to get himself off the hook for the damage done uh, to the uh, the ecology of, of Lake Ermia. Um, by rapidly reducing water levels, blaming Europeans for using cloud seeding technologies to cause a drought in Iran. Um, there was little evidence that that was being done, and clearly the massive mismanagement of, of the, the water resources in the in the Ermia Basin was the cause of the problem. But the precedent is really there. Um, it's not difficult to suggest that politicians <laughs> will blame other countries for artificially doing things, causing them um, uh, have difficulties, particularly with disruptive agricultural systems. And the, the difficulty we have here is that there is no clear um, governance mechanism, there is no clear agreement on how such experiments might be governed. Um, and if we are heading towards two degrees, um, it's high time we thought seriously um, about how to uh, get an agreed upon series of protocols on how it is that we might govern this. Um, it's important for scientists to stop and think about the ethics of this. There's been a couple of experiments um, that have been cancelled, um, both in Arizona and in the north end of Sweden, by um, protests from indigenous groups whose territories are being used for this and they weren't consulted. Mm. Um, and the ethics of, of, of informed consent apply here. Um, and that was what I was hinting at. You know, are we going to tether balloons from ships into international waters to evade the legal constraints on this kind of stuff. These are the big questions that clearly the, the, anybody involved in, in, in climate science, whether it's, it's through the International Science Union or anybody else, is really does need to have to stop and think about it. I don't have a simple solution for this. What I am insisting is that we uh, have um, some intelligent discussions about governance on this before we go down that road. And now is the time to do that before mm. we get a whole lot of, 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 of governments um, and, and even perhaps 
um, corporations and trying to do this unilaterally. And the Elon Musks of this world have enough money to, to, to actually try these things. Um, and they can presumably convince somebody somewhere to let them try it in their territory um, if they're willing to chuck enough cash at it. These are the big questions that I think we need to grapple with. I'm not sure how much Ellen has left after his Twitter experiment, but... Um, well, uh, there are but, a few but, other but, people who have a lot of money too. Yeah, right? but it takes me to an interesting point because, you know, you're talking about governance and we've had an interesting question from uh, John Morrissey um, just regarding the, the issues around build back better with, with the COVID pandemic, how we managed to find a way very quickly um, to not only put money into finding scientific solutions, but, but putting effort into collective human behavioural change. Um, and and, and he, he says, it seems to me that despite the fledgling sensibility of global interconnectedness and solidarity that emerged during COVID, we have once again lost the opportunity to assist upon a conjoined sense of human environmental security. And he also references um, the Ukraine war. So, so for me, this is a, a, a very clear governance issue because we also saw during COVID some pretty serious governance, governance issues that came in around freedom of expression, um, academic freedom, the right for movement, the right to, to assembly, um, all of those kind of issues. So can you talk a bit about that? Um, yeah, I think, hello, John. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the crucial questions um, that come out of COVID are about building back better, but they're also about, you know, the, that first word is building. And I, one of the things I try to stress in my lecture and much of what I've been writing about um, recently is that we have to think about um, the, the future in terms of production. It goes to the heart of sustainable development because it's quite literally what we are making. Um, and who is deciding what it is that gets made. Um, the crucial point about COVID was the suddenly governments discovered that they had all sorts of financial tools um, to influence public policy in ways that until you know, a few months previously they flatly denied was possible. Um, the role of, of central banks um, uh, in, I don't want to get down the whole rabbit hole of new monetary theory and all that stuff, but the real crucial questions about where large amounts of money are being um, directed um, into doing what um, as has been highlighted by COVID, but it's also been highlighted um, by the Ukraine war in terms of the European response in terms of, of, of rapidly moving away from Russian um, gas, because the speed with which that has been done um, has had all sorts of disruptive repercussions elsewhere in the international um, fuel business. Um, but it's also suggested that priorities uh, can be invoked in emergency circumstances in, in ways that might actually make a huge difference in terms of, of, of climate. Ironically, um, the rapid increase in, in, in investments in renewables and um, uh, in, in terms of efficiencies, heat pumps and all the rest of it, um, suggests the possibility of, in fact, the war um, in Ukraine accelerating um, renewable um, technology. They, there's a, an, an item in the, I think it's the current issue of The Economist, suggesting that, that this is actually kick-starting mm -hmm. the transition, which is hugely ironic. Um, but if you've been reading Earth System literature for anything like as long as I have, um, it's these perverse consequences um, that pop up in all sorts of interesting ways because we live in such an interconnected system that we need to stop and think about how you do that in terms of governance um, for geoengineering is something we need to think about. Um, but it comes down to the, the, the politics of where it is large resources are, 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 um, are, are, are focused. Um, if they are focused on building windmills and solar panels and retrofitting buildings, um, we get a very different uh, future than if they're focused on expanding natural gas uh, facilities uh, and more pipelines and more tankers. It's a completely different mm. um, uh, future. And I think that that's why the COVID responses um, uh, really have illustrated that there are all sorts of political possibilities there once um, politicians be convinced that it's in their interests how to move on these things. Uh, and it's and, yes, and it's that. about convincing people that the existential threat is just as real as it was and, for and COVID. Absolutely, and I mean, um, that, that's, that's what the whole security discussion yes. has been about. The problem with a lot of the environmental security discussion <clears throat> has been that it's focused on potential um, instabilities supposedly caused um, by uh, rural 
uh, disruptions in, in the global south, whether these feed terrorism or whether they then become a threat multiplier, um, uh, that is one mechanism that has been trying to get security thinkers' attention, but it doesn't necessarily give you the kind of policy response that you need, because if you're simply doing more military interventions in the global south, it's not solving the, the, the climate change problem. Uh, the problem is, is, is production in, in, and, and the consumption of fuels in the north. And that's what needs to be, needs to be addressed. Um, and hence, we've had a disconnect between the climate security discussion mm. of, um, of supposed threat multipliers, whereas, in fact, that's only dealing with some symptoms. The focus needs to be on the cause, which is the over, massive overuse of, of, of fuels, um, in, in, in mostly in, in the global north. Uh, and, and in other places where fossil fuels are, are the basis for the, for the development. The contradictions between um, the sustainable development goals on energy security and climate change um, have, have been discussed by many people, but we need to keep our eye on that because the future has to be um, one that is without fuels uh, and, and it has to be one that uses the resources that can be mobilized in emergency mm -hmm. circumstances to build an infrastructure that doesn't require burning stuff. I, 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 during your lecture, you mentioned Stockholm Plus 50, and I think this leads into a question um, um, Alekos um, has also raised about... Um, I, this, I'm going to frame the question in this way. I, I, the, the, 50 years ago, when, when the Stockholm meeting happened, a group of 2,000 environmental scientists got together in Menton in France and they signed a letter that they sent, um, and it's, you can find it in the UNESCO Courier. Um, and in fact, I have put a link in to the Stockholm Plus 50 campaign. And when you read this letter, you know, there's a bit of 1970s language in this letter, but essentially you can read that letter and think, wow, this could be written today. And so there is a disconnect between the, the scientific evidence, the knowledge brokerage, um, what we need to be doing and, and what Ale Alexis has raised is a really interesting point for me and and, and you know we, we talk about this in terms of responsible advocacy and, and he's saying you know we should sign a petition for global disarmament around you know the fossil fuels uh, a, a non-proliferation treaty on fossil on fossil fuels uh, where does that line draw between um, the scientific community saying to the policymakers look here's the evidence um, versus, you know, and you mentioned Greta Thunberg and her her climate strike and and the the, the discussion that she's moved forward. Where, where where do we sit as a scientific community when it comes to to knowledge brokerage and, and evidence based policy making? Versus, we've got one planet. It's fifty years. We're still saying the same things. What what has to give here? Well, I mean, we simply can't avoid the politics of this. Um, this is increasingly becoming an issue for, for many practicing scientists. Um, uh, if they go and get themselves arrested to try to make the point more effectively, um, is this considered by some governing authorities and, and universities as, as professional malpractice? It would seem to me to be in, um, a really important question because if presenting in, in very nicely phrased, very politely to the politicians and policymakers saying, look, this is the evidence, this is what you need to do, and they're refusing to budge on it. Well, then do we actually have a responsibility to act as citizens, um, not just as evidence producers um, and, and act politically? And I think that question has, has, has been um, uh, on Twitter in the, in the last little while um, uh, in, with increasing urgency. Um, because the, the threats of, of rapid destabilization of the climate system are, are patently obvious. Um, the tree down the, the, the road that nearly um, cut me off um, from this seminar um, the, 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 this morning, um, this morning in my time zone, out here on the west coast of, of Canada, um, is, is, is really making the, 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 the point about the relationship between knowledge and power. Mm. Um, part of many discussions of, of, of social science over the last few decades, but we're getting to the crunch point here. Um, where can you effectively influence people to act on this? Um, and if the policymakers, um, in, let me simply speak about Canada, where the sheer number of, of, of fuel company lobbyists um, in both the provincial and federal governments hopelessly outnumber um, mm. conventional environmentalists, the scientific advisory committees are fairly clear 
um, on, on part of the, uh, the, the, the climate um, discussion in Canada, but there's nobody getting a handle effectively on the continued production of fossil fuels. Um, the responses were beginning to get um, uh, uh, people on the consumption end of it thinking about this, although that's very patchy. We're also beginning to think about you know, building some resilience into government structures. That too um, is, is, is coming, but the, the elephant in the room is still the continued investment in the fossil fuel sector. Um, and, that and the fuel subsidies, the fuel subsidies. And the fuel and, subsidies, and fuel that subsidies in all sorts of places. But the taxpayer um, is paying for our own demise in some respects. Yeah, and, and, and it's that contradiction that, that, mm. that needs to get, get tackled. Now, in answer to your question, I mean, this works a bit differently in different jurisdictions. Um, uh, and the, the, you know, the geography keeps coming back to this because in many cases, um, people want to know, well, what will happen here um, if our consumption causes chaos someplace else? Well, that's somebody else's problem, is the implicit geographical reasoning on this. And of course, this was precisely what the, the, the Stockholm Declaration um, suggested was not acceptable back in 1972, because if you read the, the declaration, it says that you can, you know, states that there's the right to exploit the resources within their territories, but not if it has deleterious consequences on other states. And of course, the global north has, has studiously ignored that, particularly when it comes to fossil fuel um, uh, exploitation. And so we are facing this, this contradiction. The answer is, is that there is no single answer, mm. but as some scientists, as citizens, as political actors, we have to find ways um, to link the global concerns about climate change with practical action in particular places. So let's, we haven't got much time left, and I think this is a good question to finish it on. And, and both Michael Meadows um, from the International Geographical Union and Maria Paradiso, who's a member of the, the ISC governing board, have touched on this. And it's about what is the role of, of, of geographers um, in addressing these challenges? What is the role in science diplomacy? And, and, and I would ask more broadly, you know, we have nine geo unions as part of this lecture series. Um, what is the role of, of our international science system that was built some time ago? Um, is it fit for purpose for the 21st century? Um, you know, you've talked about us as uh, citizens, as, as, as entities who can make change, but in terms of our science system, what we've created as an international science uh, council through those systems, what, what, what can we do to move this forward and end on a note of hope? <laughs> Um, I mean, in my lecture, I was suggesting that, you know, we need to stop and think much more carefully about the academic division of labor. Um, and, and one of the things I have tried to do in this lecture, um, in the book called Rethinking Environmental Security, that, that basically lays out quite a lot of the stuff I was talking about in, in more detail, um, is to challenge the, the distinction between the social and, and the physical sciences. Um, and geographers should be some of the best people at doing this. Um, the, you know, I published a short piece in Progress in Human Geography way back a decade ago with a bunch of colleagues, um, you know, suggesting that the Anthropocene was actually a, a, a sort of a master concept which would allow us to synthesize a lot of these things in, in educational terms. Um, trying to get um, politicians and policymakers uh, to understand the interconnection um, between both the natural and, the, and, and the, the social, but also across those boundaries and under, explicitly point out the contradictions that cross those boundaries um, is, is certainly our, our, our political and pedagogic task. As to whether that um, is best done with the existing organizational structure for the international science unions, um, I really don't think I can comment on that because I don't understand the mechanics of how those organizations actually work. Um, but clearly the pedagogic task is, is, is to get language like the Pyrocene and the Anthropocene into the heart of how we get um, students to think um, about their place in the world and try to also get such reconfigurations of how we understand the world um, into the heads of, of, of politicians as well, um, because clearly they need to be articulating concerns about these things um, much more explicitly to, um, to populations uh, in, in numerous parts of the world. Um, as to why it is that we need to act. But I also think in terms of the positive twist that you want, I mean, one of the things that I didn't put in the lecture, but I find huge, very, very humorous, but also very interesting, 
is that the slogan that we probably need for many parts of the world is actually comes from of all people Ronald Reagan, because back before he became a politician, his he was a pitchman for General Electric and Westinghouse and a few other electrical companies, and the slogan was um, um, "Live better electrically." Right. Um, uh, and and I mean, ironically, that's exactly the right slogan for our present times. But it does make us um, shift from fuel to um, electricity, um, getting away from the problems of combustion to think about how we live better, um, but do so using different technologies, which are much um, saner for us and, 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 and much more sensible for the climate. It's, it's that kind of, of shifting cultural awareness of our position in the big order of things that I think goes to the heart of, of what Ethan Twan used to say that you know, our task as geographers um, is to study the earth as, as the whole of humanity. Um, and if we can join up those dots in ways that reach larger audiences outside the sciences, then we are doing our job. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor Darby, for a rich um, session today. We had a few glitches in the technological system, both at our end and at yours. Um, so sometimes, you know, the digital revolution might not all be it's cracked up to be. Um, I don't know. I don't know what happened to my laptop? My apologies about that. It just froze okay. in the middle of days. We had some issues at our end. It all worked out in the end. And um, I want to thank you for your generous amount of time that you have given today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, our lecture series will continue. Um, in fact, we've just both put this in the same time. So the next one will be on uh, apprehending the duality of disaster risk and sustainable development. And in fact, the International Science Council is using one of the mechanisms that exists, um, the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction. Uh, we will be producing a midterm review next week on the 1st of March, um, which is a scientific review of the, of the disaster risk uh, reduction strategy. So if you're interested in that, please uh, check back with us on the 1st of March next week when we release this important report and sign up for the next series um, in the lecture theatre. Professor Dalby, thank you very much again. Where can people follow you on Twitter if they're in, if they're in this space? Um, yes, I'm on Twitter at geopolsimon. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a, it's, a, it's a dreadful um, handle, but I'm stuck with it because I started using it for a class many years ago and I'm still using it. Okay, so um, feel, feel free to follow to follow Professor Dalby, and uh, can I thank Alec as well um, for, for for putting this together. Alec, thank you so much. Um, we'll also be hopefully this will go on to the uh, International Year for Basic Science and, and Sustainable Development. Um, and someone asked before if this recorded. Yes, it is. Uh, we will be sending you uh, a recording uh, you can access um, through the IOC website.